I missed out on actually playing 4E, so all I knew about it were the very strong opinions people had. According to the Peanut Gallery, it was both the best and worst TTRPG ever produced. I decided to find out for myself and pick up a copy of the 4E DMG, which I fell in love with. And recently, I got a copy of the 4E DMG 2, and I found even more rules from that book you can steal and drop into your 5E or other games to make them a little sharper and more fun. Let's dig into four rules to steal from the DMG 2. First up, let's talk about cooperative arcs. There are TTRPGs where improv collaboration is the norm. As in, the GM says, the party enters the tavern. Jennifer, what does the bartender look like? In my games, I usually do a critical role style killing blow where I ask the player to give me a quick time event description of how they finish off the last enemy in combat. But generally, in most D&D tables, the DM creates a scenario and sets the scene and then asks the players to make decisions. But before you rush off to the comments to claim I'm wrong, of course, your table might be different. You might collaborate more on story elements, but most tables I've played at, the DM narrates the world and the players react and make choices. The DM tosses the toys on the living room floor and the PCs choose which ones they want to play with. But cooperative arcs from 4th edition offer a more collaborative style of campaign from the beginning. It says to ask the players to come to a session zero with a story pitch in mind, then essentially workshop that as a group to forge that into a campaign. So Jennifer brings an idea about stopping an ancient evil. Cooper offers his pitch about recovering a powerful artifact from the Underdark. The group debates these and other ideas and settles on a campaign where they venture into the Underdark to recover an artifact in order to stop an ancient evil, or you know, some other middle ground. This is a fantastic option if you have the kind of engaged players who want a bigger stake in the storytelling. It reminds me of NADPOD, not another D&D podcast, during the session zero for either campaign two or three I don't remember exactly which one. But in that episode, the DM Brian Murphy started out by showing his players a map of the campaign world. He gave some brief description of the various peoples and historical events around the map, saying things like, these mountains over here used to belong to the dwarves, but a dragon forced them out. This forest over here is home to mysterious drow who have dabbled in forbidden magic basically tossing out a few vague plot hooks. Then his players took those ideas and essentially built their own campaign goals centered around what they learned about the map. I don't remember exactly, but using my previous examples, they may have said something like, oh, what if we went into the forest and learned the forbidden drow magic so we could help the dwarves by defeating the dragon? Then we'll empower the dwarves to fight the drow. Now the players are highly invested because they have a hand in choosing the kind of story they want to tell. And then the players Players can refine their character backstories to include elements that tie into this. Collaboration fosters engagement. Hey, that sounds like a quotable line. There we go. Next on our list is motivations and interrelationships. This is how the group and the individual PCs work as a team and solo to do the things they do. Many, many other TTRPGs have this, like the team concept in Monster of the Week. I'm quite baffled this was overlooked in the 2014 5th edition D&D books, because it's so helpful not only to planning the campaign for the DM, but also for the players to help define their characters. Motivations are quite simply coming up with a reason for adventuring treasure or glory or knowledge or whatever. But it makes absolute sense that since adventuring is such a dangerous business that one would want to have a strong reason to engage in it. Having these motivations also helps the DM know what sorts of things to put in your path. If your PC motivation is to expel an evil duchess who rules over your homeland and subjugates your kin, then as you explore, the DM can periodically give you bits of information that will be useful in eventually toppling that duchess. I played in a Dungeon of the Mad Mage campaign where my PC's motivation was to earn enough gold to get his sister out of Waterdeep and away from the criminal gangs who threatened her. Basically, he wanted to become rich enough to buy a private island. Halfway through the campaign, he'd accomplished that, but I wasn't ready to retire that character. So I changed his motivation, now that he knew his sister was safe, to defeating the Mad Mage himself. Also, interrelationships are a mechanic to establish complex ties with other PCs in the party. The book suggests that each player work with the group to define a quote, tie of loyalty, and also create a negative relationship in the party. A positive one would be something like, my fighter and the barbarian were in the war together and we fought side by side in many battles. I trust the barbarian with my life. 
and also a contrasting relationship or conflict. This would be something like the virtuous paladin always eyeing the shifty rogue, or the drow PC having a problem with the half-orc PC. In that Mad Mage campaign, my PC was completely grossed out by our satyr barbarian because he always wanted to eat fallen enemies after combat. Yuck. But it was a playful conflict with my PC often fake barfing whenever it happened. The DMG2 makes it clear that these negative relationships should be light-hearted. It says, you want to achieve amusing banter, not genuine rancor. Think of the relationship between Dwarf Gimli and Elf Legolas in The Lord of the Rings. And you, DM, should talk to your players about how much internal conflict the table is willing to roleplay. Our third DMG2 rule to steal is vignettes. These are basically structured slices of roleplay scenes. They are interactions, flashbacks, dream sequences, transitions, and third-person teasers. Interactions are for dramatizing current conflicts between PCs or between the party and NPCs. Flashbacks are for demonstrating specific past events in a character's life. Dream sequences highlight inner conflict in a surreal environment. These are a great way to offer exposition, like your subconscious telling you what to do next. Transitions are montages used to cover many sequential events quickly, like when you need to do a time jump in a campaign. And third-person teasers are for scenes that don't directly involve the PCs, but can be used to give information to the players that their characters wouldn't know in-game. Now let's talk about how and why you would use these. I think there are a couple of ways to implement this in your game. First is directly. You can just say to your players, now we're going to have a flashback. Jennifer, when your barbarian PC was young, tell us about a time when she was unable to stand up to a bully. And then you can roleplay that out. Then you give that PC some spotlight time and allow the events to illuminate whatever is currently going on in the campaign. Matt Mercer from Critical Role makes heavy use of dream sequences in Campaign 3 for Laura Bailey's character Imogen Temult. He uses these to blur the lines between what's real and what's not in a really effective way. I like to use third-person teasers from time to time when I'll say something like, Here's what your characters don't see. Across the room, the guildmaster secretly slipped the duke a bag full of gold. I would only use that last one if you have the kind of table who knows not to metagame. The other way to implement these in your game is in a more free-flowing manner where you don't actually say, let's have a role-playing interaction to work this out. You just do it. In this case, these vignette styles are useful for your DM categorization. Having these varied types of RP is more for your own benefit, because maybe you award a certain amount of XP for interactions versus flashbacks. Now let's talk about companion stats. 4th edition has this concept of companions, which was essentially translated into sidekicks in 5e. Both companions and sidekicks are decent systems, so I'm not here to tell you to use one over the other. I mean, it would be really nice if D&D Beyond had better support for sidekicks, but that's a complaint for another day. Actually, I want to talk about three specific tables in the DMG2. In the section for companion character traits, the book gives a table for companion agendas, behavioral traits, and secrets. I'll leave these on the screen for a minute so you can take it in. Part of being a DM or GM is coming up with NPCs on the fly when your party decides to engage some total rando that you never saw coming. In the steeplechase season of the Adventure Zone, GM Justin McElroy names all of his random NPCs Justin, which is hilarious. I feel his pain. But beyond coming up with names, it helps to also quickly have personality details for these NPCs. Hence, these tables. Did the party spare the life of the last remaining goblin in combat and decide to adopt them? Three quick rolls and now that goblin has a personality, a desire, and a secret. Just like that. This is one of those preparation helps you improv things. Keeping these tables handy can take a lot of the weight off your shoulders when you need to make a quality NPC, companion, or sidekick on the fly. So there we have a cluster of 4th edition DMG2 rules to steal and shove down your pants while you whistle and casually walk away from the 4E store. Don't let anyone see you. If you like this video, I've got a whole playlist of 4E things you could steal and add into your 5E games or any TTRPG system really. Because the game is whatever you make it, so steal and change and homebrew and do whatever else you think is fun for your table. It's your game. Have fun the way you want. Until next time, this is GM Jim. Do what makes you happy.